Last week we were we started teaching from Luke chapter 18 verse 1 on the subject of always praying and never losing heart. And we started in this passage Luke chapter 18 verse 1 where it says that he told them a parable to the effect. All right, so Jesus wants this parable to have a certain effect on your life. Are you ready for this? He wants this parable to have the effect that you will always pray. Pray without ceasing. Pray day and night and call upon the Lord and seek his face and not lose what? Not lose heart. And if you see there that word don't lose heart, it means don't get discouraged. Don't give up. Don't grow weary. Don't get exhausted of praying but always seek God in prayer, making your requests and petitions known to him. And so I can't remember, it's either five or six reasons why we don't lose heart. And last week we went through number one, and tonight we'll just go through number two. But how many of you sometimes get, do you ever get tired? Do you ever get tired or, you know, a little discouraged about coming to church or about reading your Bible or about seeking the Lord in prayer or pursuing Him or drawing close to Him? You know, sometimes you feel like He's a million miles away or sometimes you feel like He's just not answering your prayer and you just kind of get discouraged. But why bother praying? Why keep seeking the Lord when nothing seems to be changing or improving? I think we all go through times like that. And Jesus here is saying, look, guys, I want you always to pray. And I don't want you getting discouraged. And I don't want you giving up. And I don't want you getting tired. And I don't want you getting overwhelmed by circumstances in life. I want you to always pray and never give up. And so then he gives this story. He said, in a certain city, there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected man. And so Jesus is he's making the point here that this judge really didn't care for anybody. He didn't fear God. He had no respect for man. He just kind of did what he wanted, and it didn't matter what you wanted or what you needed. But there was a widow, and a widow who kept coming to him saying, give me justice against my adversary. And so we see here very clearly, we mentioned last week, you know, there are some who say that if you pray about something twice, then it means the first time he prayed in unbelief, and that's not, that's nonsense. Here, she was bringing to this judge the same circumstance again and again, and you're going to pray about things a whole lot more than one time in your life. Jesus, we know, going to the cross had to pray three times before that was finally resolved in his heart. And so there's going to be things that we continue to pray over and over again. Thank you, Sal. For a while he refused, but afterward he said to himself, though I neither fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice. (laughs) So he he wouldn't do it for God and he wouldn't do it for man, but he'd do it for this widow so that she will not beat me down by her what? Continual coming. And so Jesus here is not advocating in any way that we wear God down. We couldn't if we tried. But he is stating the fact here. He wants us to continually come to God, continue in prayer, continue in faith, continue in hope, never get discouraged. And the Lord said, hear what the unjust judge says. Will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night. How many of you have been through such a hard trial that you couldn't bear through day and night without prayer, without seeking him? He says, will he delay over long over them? And look at verse 8. I tell you, he will give justice to them what? Speedily. Now, sometimes it doesn't feel speedily, does it? Sometimes it feels like it's taking a long time. And we know, you know, we have certain perimeters that the scriptures set. If we're just praying out of pure selfishness or pride, God doesn't hear those prayers. 
He only hears prayers that are in accordance to his will, right? And so we take that off of the table. There are times where we're praying according to God's will, but maybe our motives aren't altogether quite right. And so in the process of prayer, he's cleansing those motives and correcting them. But I want you to see here, Jesus said he will give justice to them speedily. And I just put that note there, it is the heart of your heavenly Father to provide the answer as soon as possible. That's what Jesus is communicating in verse 8. God wants to answer your prayer in a tangible way as soon as possible. And if it has to wait, then there's a good reason for it. Either you're not ready, or the overall timetable is not ready, or someone else that's affected is not ready, or maybe certain circumstances have to happen first before things are ready. But it's kind of like, you know, where it says that in due time, uh, God brought forth his son in due time. There's just that, that uh, wonderful supernatural moment when everything clicks into place and the answer comes through. And sometimes we can't figure out why or when. But if you do have to wait for the answer, I put there as a question, will you wait patiently and contentedly, trusting God that he is right and that he's good? And if I have to wait for this answer, then there's a good reason for me to wait. And I don't need to understand why, I just need to trust. So to us, it seems like God, we're waiting, and why are you so late, and why don't you do something? But Jesus promises us our Heavenly Father wants to give us the answer as soon as possible. And so just settle that in your heart. And if you're praying and still waiting, then there's a good reason for it. And when the answer comes, trust God, you'll be glad that you waited. You'll see why, and you'll understand God did this in a perfect way, in a perfect time. So just don't give up. Don't lose heart. Keep coming to him. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 35, Therefore do not throw away your confidence, which has great reward. Don't give up trusting and hoping in God. For you have need of endurance, that when you've done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. Yet a little while, and the coming one will come and will not delay. But my righteous one shall live by faith. We live by the word of God. We live by faith. We live by the unseen. That is what regulates our life. We don't live by circumstances. We don't live by what this world says. We don't live by what other people might say. We live by the word of God. That is our vision. That's our promise. And that's what we are holding up before God in prayer. Watch this. If he shrinks back, my soul has what? No pleasure in him. As we're seeking God, and we're seeking his life and his moving and his revival in our life, if we shrink back and say, oh, it's not worth it, nothing's happening, this is boring. You know, we, we talked a little bit last week about being in the wilderness and, you know, being at the Red Sea with the miracles and with God delivering Egypt, that was the fun part, right? And then about six weeks in, the honeymoon was over and they were grumbling and complaining in the wilderness because it was boring. They didn't have anything to eat or drink and they didn't have the leeks or the onions like they did back in Egypt. And if we shrink back, if we ever, be, ever begin to doubt the goodness of our God, if we ever draw back from seeking Him continually in prayer, the Bible says He will have no pleasure in us. You don't want that, do you? I don't want that. We want God to have pleasure in us. And believe me, when He looks down and you are trusting Him, when it seems like all hope is gone, when you are seeking him, no matter what happens in this life, he is pleased with that. And he sees a loving, adoring, trusting child. 
And don't think for a moment he's not moved. He is. He goes on in verse 39 and he says, but we are not of those who shrink back and are not destroyed. Catch what he's saying here. If if we shrink back from pursuing God, if we shrink back from our faith, if we just kind of give up and say it's not working, we will be destroyed. But we are those who have faith and preserve our souls. Because even if the fig tree does not blossom, even if the vine yields no fruit, we will praise and trust our God. Even if he slays me, I will still trust him. Even if he doesn't deliver me from the fiery furnace, we're not going to bow our knee to this world or to Satan. We will continue to worship him and thank him. And he says, if we have that type of faith that won't let go, that continues to persevere, we will preserve our souls to the saving of our souls. And so we said last week, number one, the first reason never to give up in prayer is that God is working even when we don't see him working. And remember just very quickly the example in 2 Kings, Elisha's servant He wakes up, chapter 6, verse 15, and an army with horses and chariots are all around the city. And he says, alas, my master, what shall we do? And Elisha says, what? Do not be afraid, for those who are with us are more than those who are with him. And so Elisha prays, and he says, Lord, please open his eyes that he may see. And when the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, guess what he saw? Mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. And so like this young man, this servant, you might be scared. You might be confused. You might be depressed. You might be discouraged. But just because you don't see God moving doesn't mean he's not moving. He's moving all right. And there are things happening in the unseen world that you cannot perceive, you cannot comprehend, you have no way of naturally knowing, trust that your God is moving on your behalf even in those times when you can't see it because he is. All right, so number one, God's working even when we don't have any natural indications. And we took a look real quick at uh, Abraham in the book of Romans chapter four and how Abraham hoped he had faith even when there was no hope. When all hope was against him, he still believed in a faithful God. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body. And it may not be your body that you're looking at. You may be looking at a relationship. You may be looking at a circumstance. You may be looking at something you're experiencing out in the world. Your faith can't weaken as you go and confront these things day by day. Abraham's faith didn't weaken when he looked at his own body. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. Stay fully convinced that God is able to do. One of the best ways you can do that is just continue in praise and worship. Just as it says there, he grew strong in faith as he gave glory to God. Stay in God's presence. Continue to worship and praise Him. Continue to pray and worship Him from His Word. Repeat the promises of God until you have them memorized. Get the Word deep down into your heart, and that's what causes you to be fully convinced. It's the Word of God alive in you. Number two, the second reason why we never give up in prayer Remember, there's nothing impossible with God. And because we're out of time, let me just go to uh, the book of Acts real quick. Acts chapter 12, verse 1. About that time, Herod the king laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. He killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. 
It was good politically to keep the Jews on your side. They controlled, at that point, at that time, they controlled the culture, the common man of the day. And so because it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. What do you think he was going to do to Peter? Kill him. This was during the days of unleavened bread. And when he had seized him, he put him in prison, delivering him over to four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending after the Passover to bring him out to the people for a mock trial, to humiliate him, to sentence him to death. Four squads of soldiers, a squad was four soldiers, and so there was four squads or four groups of four soldiers, which is what? A total of 16 men. The reason why they did it this way, uh, history tells us that like with Israel or with the Assyrians, they divided the night watches into three night watches. Rome was different. They divided the night watch into four night watches. Now, why do you think they did that? So they'd stay awake, right? They would have a shorter time to stay awake and to stay in guard. And so what would happen is that two of the soldiers would be chained to the prisoner, and then two, the other two soldiers would guard the entrance to the prison. And then they would, you know, that group of four then would finish and go to sleep, and the next group of four would come and keep watch. And so this was going to go on through the night, and in the morning, uh, he was going to bring... Peter out for him to be condemned. So Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. We really do need to emphasize prayer, and we need to emphasize prayer more and more. Because instead of gimmicks and games and events and activities, we need to find a group of people who are coming to church to seek God, to where God is all that they desire. God is enough. God is not boring. He is their life. And they love coming together with other Christians to seek God in prayer. Earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. Now, when Herod was about to bring him out on that very night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers. I think that's a great miracle right there. If I was Peter, I wouldn't have been sleeping. I mean, you're sitting there thinking, come daylight, I'm dead just like James. How many of you would be sleeping? I wouldn't be sleeping. It shows what peace though Peter was in, right? Great peace. Just like uh, when Stephen died and he was stoned to death, it said he just fell asleep And the scriptures are written that way to describe to us in in the midst of the violence, look how much peace the presence and grace of God can bring you. And Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains, and the other two guys, other two sentries were before the door. They were guarding the prison. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood next to him, and a light shone in the cell... He struck Peter on the side and woke him, right, wives? Any of you have snoring husbands? And you do one one of those, you know, get him him real good in the side to wake him up. Peter had to be struck on the side to wake up, saying, get up quickly. And the chains just fell off his hands. And the angel said to him, dress yourself and put on your sandals. And he did so. And he said to him, wrap your cloak around you and follow me. I love verse 9. So Peter goes out and he follows him, but he didn't know what was being done, if it was real or not. He, he thought he was seeing a vision. He must have been pretty groggy. So he's kind of stumbling through this, not knowing if it's real or not. And then they passed the first and then the second guard. Those were the guys at the door. They came to the iron gate leading into the city, and the gate opened for them of its own accord. Can you picture this? What? I think this is one of the greatest miracles in the Bible. This is just as great as passing through the Red Sea on dry ground. 
I mean, what, what was up with these four soldiers? Were they just stunned in fear? Did the Lord cause a deep sleep to come on them? You know, what is going on? They went out and went along one street, and immediately the angel left him. When Peter came to himself, he said, Now I am sure that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod and from all the Jewish people were expecting. From all that the Jewish people were expecting. What were they expecting? They were expecting him to be killed, just like James. Now think of this. This... And this just shows you how God can do the impossible. There was no way out of this. How was Peter going to get out of this? He was chained to two soldiers. There were two more guarding the door. Just by some chance, Peter did get free and was trying to make a run for it. It was impossible for him to get out of this. And they were fully expecting him to be killed, just like James. Because Herod wanted to make an example out of them. When he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose other name was Mark, where many were gathered together and were praying. God help us to be praying. And may God be merciful to us for when he comes back to find us praying. When he knocked at the door of the gateway, a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer. Recognizing Peter's voice in her joy, she did not open the gate, but ran in and reported that Peter was standing at the gate. Come on, Rhoda. What are you thinking, girl? They said to her, you are out of your mind. But she kept insisting that it was so. And they kept saying, it is his angel. <laughs> Poor Peter, he's out there, knock, 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 knock. And when they opened, they saw him and were amazed. He motioned to them to be silent. He described to them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he said, tell these things to James and to the brothers. Then he departed and he went to another place. Wise man. When the day came, there was no little disturbance among the soldiers over what uh, had become of Peter. And after Herod searched for him and did not find him, he examined the sentries and ordered that they should be put to death. That's a bad night for those four guys. Then he went down from Judea to Caesarea and spent time there. So as we go to prayer, we just need to remember, <laughs> there is nothing that can stop God. There is nothing he cannot do. There is no natural law. There is no political force. There is no army or navy. There is no kingdom that can stand against him. When he decides what he is going to do, nothing can stop his hand. He can do the impossible things.